to try to do is kind of put energy policy in a little bit of a broader context. Let me first tell you a little bit about what the National Commission on Energy Policy is, since it's a household name, but all the people who <laughs> know it work for me. So I don't expect that uh, many of you are familiar with what the idea was to bring kind of a bipartisan group together to try to confuse the energy policy debate for a little while, long enough to try to make some progress. Then I'm going to speak a little bit about climate change. I think uh, you've heard about that quite a bit in the morning through some excellent speeches. Try to provide a little bit of context for how we see that affecting not only just the kind of environmental side of the debate, but the overall energy policy process. And so that I don't hold this the whole time, I'm going to put it down. Thanks. And then I want to talk about some of the other policies that are going to be really critical to making this all work, because we also have some other big problems we have to, to deal with. Not only do we have to deal with climate change, but there's also oil dependence. I think you've all probably heard a lot recently about energy independence. You're going to hear a lot more about that as the Fourth of July approaches, because that's the moment when everyone who's been elected to a federal, state, or local office has to come give an energy independence speech to kind of line up the dots. And then there's some kind of key things that have gotten a lot of attention lately, like ethanol and nuclear power, and try to see if we can kind of talk about how those fit together. But just to, to get it started, um, energy policy has been really stuck in this country. Um, for about a decade, there's been a big kind of shouting match in Washington with some people arguing that we need to go drill for oil in Alaska, other people saying we need to sign the Kyoto Protocol, and there hasn't been a tremendous amount of progress in the middle. So about five years ago, a bunch of uh, charitable foundations, um, in particular the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. So every time you hit print on one of your term papers, you're just doing a little bit of a, a nice thing for us, uh, decided to bring together a group of people who were um, so bizarrely diverse, both diverse in terms of their expertise. We have people who were the CEOs of nuclear power companies and oil companies, people who ran environmental organizations, scientists, lawyers, policy hacks. Um, and a group that really was very deeply bipartisan, because so much of what's happening in Washington right now is you know, it's kind of a whose side are you on game. And so the goal was to get a group that was really so broad that if it could agree to anything, it would literally just confuse the elected officials long enough if you had the head of a nuclear power company and the head of an environmental organization coming together and saying, we both think you should support this climate change policy, that people would exhale a little bit and try to listen to some, some different ideas. And so this was the inspiration for the National Commission on Energy Policy. And we brought a group of about 20 people together. Um, we spent about three years, um, did a ridiculous number of studies, and at the end of the day came out with a set of policies that really did um, kind of try to find a, a middle in what has been a pretty polarized debate. And in Washington, I think maybe everywhere, but the middle is a pretty lonely place these days. Um, everyone has a very strong view on all sides of the debate, and getting people to come together and take essentially unpopular positions positions, in fact, that not a single member of our commission um, was comfortable with our final report. In fact, this, the strength of the exercise was each and every one of them were deeply uncomfortable with it, but yet were willing, in fact, to hold together and still kind of advocate collectively for something that they felt was principally in the best interests of the country. And uh, as Congressman Fry and others can tell you, that's, uh, that's no small feat um, these days in Washington. Um, so that was what really, I think, brought uh, me into this discussion. What I want to talk about a little bit is what we proposed on climate change, try to put that in the, the context of what's happening in Washington, and then really focus on some of the other key policies in addition to a, a cap and trade that I know you heard about, which I think is gaining a lot of, uh, a lot of attention. Um, so one of the real difficult challenges, um, probably the hardest problem we have right now with climate change, is that the, the ecological imperative, the amount of pollution that we need to reduce in order to actually have a sustainable climate, is totally out of whack with political possibility. In other words, what the science says, and it's very clear, is we need very significant reductions very quickly. And right now, we have, I think, two choices in Washington. We can either have a much more modest program quickly, or we can continue to try to work through these issues so that a different kind of political consensus forms so that we can have a much, much more aggressive program in the future. And this is a real big fight. Up until now, uh, the battle over climate change has been half the people saying yes and half the people saying no. The good news is now that people are fighting very aggressively within the yes camp, which means that we're actually close to getting something done, because when half are saying yes and half are saying no, um, hard to actually imagine you're going to have a, a political breakthrough. Um, so now what we're finding is that there's a big debate, and the debate is how aggressively can we as a country start to reverse the last hundred years of momentum, right? We've been a fossil fuel economy for over a hundred years. There's a lot of negative 
momentum in the system. It's almost like a, a super tanker. If you've ever seen these pictures of what it takes to get a super tanker to turn around, you decide you start wanting to turn the boat around on a, you know, on a Monday, and by Thursday, you slowly have managed to get going in the other direction. And that's what our energy economy is like. We have tremendous momentum for oil and coal and all of the infrastructure and the pipelines and the utility transmission lines. And to transition from all of that over to a different kind, I think what we're going to hear from uh, the next speaker about a different kind of energy economy that focuses more on renewables and low carbon, different alternatives, it takes a tremendous amount of, of effort. It's not something we can do quickly, especially if we want to do it in a way that's not going to undermine economic growth. And when it comes to you know, casting a vote for a difficult policy, um, you're going to hear from all sides of the issue, not just what the science says is necessary, but what the people in your district whose jobs depend on the local industry, the steel company who's concerned about fighting against uh, competition from overseas, um, all that's going to kind of come together. So our view is that um, the best thing to do for the environment right now is to put a system in place very quickly, a system that would have a cap dramatic, a cap on emissions, <laughs> but recognize that the initial cap that we could establish in Congress right now would not be strict enough in and of itself to get the emissions to the point that we need them to be. So I think the, you know, what you heard about this morning is that the basic question is if you put a limit on carbon emissions, all of a sudden it will cost some money to emit carbon. And that's a really good thing if you're trying to reduce carbon emissions because then it gets all of the creativity, all of the private sector to think, well, what's the best way we can you know, become more efficient, use more renewable resources, because we can make a profit doing that. So if you set a very, very strict carbon cap, you know, it would just magically happen. Of course, it would cost tremendous amounts of money, and it could have a very serious effect on the economy if we didn't do it intelligently. If you decide that it's just not viable, and unfortunately in this political climate, I don't think it's viable to imagine a very aggressive carbon program being put in place in the next two years, then you need to think about what's a combination of policies that can get you moving in the right direction. And so if you have a modest cap on carbon emissions, um, what that will do is it will start to get people thinking to the future. If you're putting, uh, if you're all of a sudden, you know, graduated top of your class and were immediately hired to be the CEO of uh, Florida Power and Light, um, you'd have some tough decisions to make because you're going to have to build power plants that are going to be around basically your entire career. Power plants last about 50 years. So if you're going to decide today in 2007 to build a power plant, you not only have to think about what the economics are right now, but you have to think literally for three or four decades. So a, a modest carbon say, price right now says to you, well, it might be okay to build coal now, but in 30 years, the price might get so high that, that coal won't be, in fact, an economically viable fuel anymore. So setting up, setting up a small price right now has a benefit in the long term, but what it will not do is right away make carbon sequestration or massive you know, nationwide solar power such that we really can start relying on fossil fuels. It won't make those kinds of technologies cost effective. So in addition to the envelope of a carbon price, we also have to do a bunch of other things if we're going to have a shot at really turning the boat around. Um, and what I want to focus on mostly are the ways in which climate policy and oil policy interact, because those are really the two fundamental challenges that we face. How do we at once significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, and significantly reduce our oil dependence. A lot of the challenge comes from coal, and a lot of it comes from cars. I mean, if you really had just, you know, two things and you wanted to start with the same letter, uh, coals and cars, <laughs> coals and cars, cars and coal, are really the two fundamental challenges. Um, the fuel economy of our cars today is actually less aggressive than the fuel economy um, required in China. We all talk about how, you know, China is coming to kind of, you know, eat our lunch and they're so huge and, you know, woe is us because if we do environmentally aggressive things and they don't, we'll be at a competitive disadvantage. There's a lot of truth there. But when it comes to fuel economy, um, we're not really doing so well. Uh, fuel economy in this country, who, who here was born in 1985? Wow. I love coming to college campuses. Um, fuel economy has not uh, increased in the lifetime of virtually all of you in this auditorium. So the cars that were produced before you were born are just as fuel efficient as the car that you could buy today. That's a disaster. And um, it doesn't mean the technology has stalled. Car engines get more efficient every year, but the car company has a choice. They can put that efficiency into making the car go farther on a gallon of fuel, or they can make the car bigger and faster. 
And for the last 20 years, what we've all decided we wanted more than fuel economy was bigger and faster cars. So the, you know, the Nissan uh, Sentra that you aspire to own sometime in the future today is actually a much more uh, high-performing vehicle than the muscle cars that your parents bought. Um, the acceleration of cars today is 50% faster. Uh, they weigh about twice as much. The engines are about three times, I'm sorry, 75% more powerful, but the fuel economy is exactly the same. Setting a cap on carbon is not going to require, in fact, the car companies to do a whole lot about that. Because what a carbon cap would do is make gasoline you know, a little more expensive, 10 cents more expensive, 20 cents more expensive. That in and of itself is not going to cause Detroit to significantly retool the facilities. It's just not a big enough incentive. So in addition to trying to perform uh, a policy that's going to try to provide some incentives for uh, carbon reductions, we're also going to have to deal with the fuel economy issue. And the good news is that after about 20 years now, things are actually very, very hot on Capitol Hill. There are a number of different proposals that I think will um, probably provide us a, a meaningful law. I think before the end of uh, this Congress, I think President Bush will sign a law that will increase fuel economy for passenger cars. And it will be the first time literally in over 20 years. Um, and the debate's been kind of interesting because you have kind of two positions on the edges. Um, what the car companies have been saying essentially is we're in big trouble here. I don't know if any of you have you know, read a business page in a newspaper recently, but we're basically um, getting our, our lunch eaten here just about every day. Lay off. You know, back off government because if you require more stringent fuel economy standards, the more technologically competent foreign competitors are just going to outcompete us. Um, you then have you know, a lot of people who are just shaking their heads saying, you know, we have to save the car companies from themselves. Essentially, if we let business as usual continue, we're going to have bad fuel economy and they're going to go out of business. So this is kind of the government knows best camp. There are a lot of uh, men and women in Congress who've been spending so many years fighting about uh, climate change. They actually pretty much pr think that they could build the cars themselves and they want to pass a law which says, you know, General Motors, Ford, Toyota, you must all increase your fuel economy by 11.6 miles per gallon. This is how you do it. These guys have been fighting with each other for a long time, not making a ton of progress. Um, there's a, a new group of folks around now who are arguing for something in the middle, which basically would have Congress obligate the auto industry to have fuel economy increase by, on average, a mile per gallon a year, which may not sound like a lot, but it's actually an incredibly aggressive uh, rate of progress. Right now, cars on the road get about 25 miles per gallon. So it's about a 4% a year increase. Unless the government agency that's responsible for setting fuel economy standards was able to prove that that was too aggressive a rate forward. And then they would have some discretion to, to modify it. Um, so this is kind of a, a good government idea where Congress takes the job of setting the direction, doesn't just defer to the executive branch to, to figure it out, but gives the executive branch and the, the experts in these agencies a little bit of discretion to kind of fine tune going forward. Um, if that becomes law and you're seeing a tremendous kind of breadth of folks getting behind it now, the president in the State of the Union called for a 4% increase in fuel economy standards, which was a really big breakthrough, didn't get a tremendous amount of attention for it. Um, you have a diverse group of senators, everyone from you know, Barack Obama to Senator Larry Craig from Idaho, both arguing in the same general direction. Um, so I think there's a very good chance that in the U.S. Senate you're going to see a fuel economy uh, program for cars pass. Uh, the good news is your cars are going to be more fuel efficient when you ultimately are out there not living in your parents' basements anymore. Um, the bad news is they're going to you know, cost a few hundred dollars more. Um, but the value that you save by not having to put as much gasoline in your car over time is going to essentially make everybody um, just about the same. The other issue that we're focused on a lot these days is not just how much fuel a car engine needs to burn, but what kind of fuel is it? Um, 97% of all of our transportation right now is fueled by oil. Um, the good news is that oil, I'm rapping. All right. That was not the peace sign, actually, ladies and gentlemen. That was the, you're running out of time. Um, most of the cars right now run all on oil. And what we now need to do is shift away just from having a single fuel. And you're hearing a lot of talk right now about ethanol, which traditionally has been made from corn. In Brazil, they make it from sugar cane. Um, it has the potential to be a really good addition to our uh, whole transportation system. Um, 
we are not going to run our entire vehicle fleet on ethanol. Uh, I think a good goal would be if we could get about 30 or 40 percent of the vehicle fleet to run on ethanol over the next 20 or 30 years. We use 150 billion gallons of gasoline. So anytime you want to change, you got to think about the, the overall scale. But the, the key with ethanol is moving away from making it out of corn, because what you need is you need to get the sugars out of the product. It's just alcohol. So a big ethanol plant right now out of corn is like, just like a big still. It's a pretty simple technology. The key now is to make it out of things that you don't also want to eat. You can make ethanol out of, name it, wood chips, rice straw, switchgrass, garbage, I mean, um, chicken shit, literally. I mean, you can make it, you literally theoretically can make it out of anything. And the key now is to come up with the chemicals that can get the sugars out of these different products and then so that you can ferment them into ethanol. So this is really, I think, where energy policy is going in the future. We're going to have a, a really, I think, healthy collision. It's going to be the collision between traditional energy policy, biotech, because a lot of what's going on right now in kind of the cutting edge of energy policy is what kinds of different biological processes can we use to break things down, make them into stuff we want. People are trying to grow algae to eat carbon. So there's a whole biotech world that's coming into play. And then communications technology. Because at the end of the day, for us to have an efficient economy, um, you all have to have good information. You have to know what it costs to turn your lights on. You have to know that at different times of the day, energy prices are higher and lower. You have to know what fuel economy your cars are getting. And so if you bring kind of the information technology forward and the biotech forward and you squeeze them in to engineering, you then have the potential, I think, for a, a much happier energy policy when you guys are running late to give talks at places where you used to be uh, running late to give papers. So um, thanks for the opportunity to come chat with you and look forward to some questions. It is my pleasure to be here uh, with you today. I'm going to talk about changing our energy fu future. I'm going to talk about this in the context mostly of the state of Florida. But I want to give you a little bit of background right, as we move through this. I think it complements much of the presentations that we've seen before as far as policy, okay, as far as cap and trade and carbon and emissions. I'm going to talk to you about your purse strings. As was already pointed out, we consume oil at a tremendous rate. You've seen that through some of the presentations earlier today. Um, this shows you a forecast at our consumption uh, rate for transportation. This was done in 2003. And as you can see here, back in the 70s, we were actually producing the bulk of our own fossil fuels that we used. Today, we uh, produce on the order of about 50% of our fossil fuels. We get 15% from the Gulf. We get 15% from Mexico. Fortunately, Mexico still likes us. Uh, we get 15% from Canada. And I'll remind you, quite a few years ago, we didn't get anything from Canada. The price of gasoline has gone up, such that now we're strip mining the tar sands in uh, northern Alberta, so there's an environmental impact associated with that. And then I will also remind you that the oil that we get, except for Mexico and Canada, um, is controlled by 11 foreign governments. Okay, So energy clearly is a political issue. If those governments want to change the price, they can do it. There's no law about being a monopoly if you're a government. Right? So I got to keep some of these contexts in mind as to the way the energy flows, particularly if we're talking about oil and fossil fuels. Okay? So clearly, as you can see here, cars, light trucks, the emissions, it's getting larger. Now, right? now I want to give you a riddle. Some of the other people up here talked about age. When I was 16 years old, so keep track of some of these numbers, I asked my parents to borrow the keys to the car. No problem. I'm sure much of you didn't see that when you were 16. Okay, they'd fight you to give you the keys cars. My parents had no problem giving me the keys cars. So I'd take the car keys and they'd tell me, go, go fill up the car. So I'd crawl around to the back of my car, look to see where the license plate ended in an odd or even number. And then that gave me the right to then stand in line for about two hours to fill up the car. Okay, now you should, if you're really good, figure out how old I am, because that was 1973. Okay, when that occurred, right? Now, there's a slight difference, okay? We are more concerned about the environment, and rightfully so. We are talking about global climate change. And I happen to live 5.7 feet above sea level, so I am really concerned. Eight meters is a huge number, okay? 5.7 meters, that's it, okay? 
Um, back then, the world had plenty of oil. Okay? So now that we're concerned about the environment, I want to make a case to you that we're running out. Okay? The President of the United States, in the last three addresses that he's had in January, typically have talked about energy to some sorts. Okay? A few years back, he announced the hydrogen initiative. There was a lot of action in that activity. And one of the activities that he state was that a child born today, this was a few years ago, will be driving a fuel cell powered car. I say fuel cell, it really says hydrogen up there, but I work on fuel cells, so I steal it a little bit. Okay? Now let's think about that a little bit. I hope the government can get their act together okay, and provide enough resources so talented people, and it'll be the future people that come and work for the various car companies or the fuel cell companies and whatnot, can develop these vehicles that today we can build them. Okay? An example, there are six Ford Focus fuel cell powered vehicles running around in the state of Florida today. Okay? Does anybody know how much a Ford Focus costs at your local dealership? About 15,000 bucks. These fuel cell powered cars are a million dollars a piece. Okay? They work. They work great. They're just too expensive. Okay? Now, I think we've got a path for that. Right? This then leads to the next comment that I make back to the President of the United States. And I'll explain this plot in a second. The child born two years ago, I hope they have a fuel cell powered car. Because by the time they're 16, there won't be any gasoline left. It's another thing to think about. All right? Let's look at this plot here. This is the actual plot then of the consumption of oil, all right, and the billions of barrels, this is the annual, so per year, as a function of time. This is a plot that's called the peak oil plot. Everybody admits that we're going to run out. The argument is exactly when, when do we meet the maximum capacity and so forth. I've taken a plot um, from some very well-respected individuals, um, the end of cheap oil. This was done in 1998. And you'll notice, if you look at this curve here, this is our consumption and the production of the world's oil. You notice, as was pointed out, we had the CAFE standards established in the 70s. And look what happened. In the first Arab oil embargo, we raised the CAFE standards. And look what the world did. We dropped our consumption rate. And here we are today. Well, here's 1998. Now, this gentleman here, Colin Campbell, forecasted that we actually hit the peak of oil in the year 2005. Now, two interesting things happened from 1998 to 2005. Unfortunately, China and India decided to be just like us. Okay? So their consumption rate gets us up to this point right here. This is 200, 2005. The world consumed 80 million barrels per day in 2000. 80 million barrels okay. in 2005. Well, if you know anything about calculus, you know, the area under the curve is still the same and all that neat kind of stuff, all right? I've redrawn the curve to fit this point here because the area under this curve, this is the total amount of oil as a function of time and as a function of the cost to get it out. So if you draw this curve under here, it comes down here. So here's us. Here's the future. Well, we've got this much oil. This is the same amount of oil that we had back in the 1955. We're going to run out. Okay? So clearly, from a fossil fuel perspective, to help not only on global climate change, we don't burn the stuff anymore. I'm telling you it's too valuable to burn in the future because it's going to be too expensive. Because we need to use it, by the way, to create our fertilizer to grow our food, too. A lot of natural gas is used for fertilizer. So it's something to think about. Okay? We talked about turning a tanker earlier. Love that metaphor. Okay? That's an oil tanker. That's Hurricane Isabella. Okay? They did turn, by the way. Okay? <laughs> I, I think it, they did it quicker than the four days you mentioned. But, but, but okay. Something we're, we're getting into. Let me talk about some economics for you. All right, let me give you another little joke. When I was 13 years old, I paid 25 cents for a gallon of gasoline. I paid a nickel for a candy bar. How much do you pay for a candy bar today? No, you guys can shop around and do better than a buck. But that makes it easy on me to do the math. So what you're telling me is the price of candy bar went up by a factor of 20. Okay, can somebody do the math for me? 20 times 25 cents is what? So why are you guys complaining about the price of gasoline? You should be complaining about the price of candy bars, okay? For some reason, Americans think energy should be free. You go into the airport, you plug your laptop into the wall, and they don't arrest you. I mean, you're stealing electricity, aren't you? 
Okay? Must be free. Okay? It's the same way we feel about air quality. We've clearly got to change our attitudes on both of those subjects. Right. In Florida, we don't grow any oil. We don't grow any gasoline. We don't grow any coal. Okay, we don't have those resources here. We ship $20 billion a year outside of the state of Florida to purchase all those fossil fuels. Can you imagine what would happen if we kept the money in the state? Talk about energy independence. This is our report card if we're talking about renewable energies. Um, the good news is Florida has every intention of doing better than the grade that you see up there. I won't tell you what that grade is. Hopefully you can figure out the graph yourself. We've got a ways to go. There are some states up there. The best ones, by the way, are still A minus states. Okay. Here's another one. There's 1,000 people a day that move to the state of Florida. We build over 160 to 190,000 homes a year. And yet our homes are the least energy efficient in the whole United States. Okay? There's an opportunity to do things right. Okay? Efficiency was mentioned. It's efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Then we'll talk about new types of fuel, new types of power generation. But we've got to do things efficiently. That's not only associated with your homes as well as your driving and your automobiles. I'll remind you that 51% of all electricity in Florida is used by us, the residents of our homes. Okay? Changing the fluorescent light bulbs will make a big difference. Okay. Turns out to be an energy efficient home, EPA standard energy efficient home, only costs on a new home about $1,600 to meet some of these standards. So we're not talking about large capital investments here. On an annualized cost of electricity, well, let me ask this question. Everybody knows what the price of a gallon of gasoline is. You're bombarded by it. You see it every day. Does anybody know what the price of electricity out of the wall is? It's interesting. You don't know. Okay. Do you know what the units on electricity out of the wall? By the way, the units on, on gasoline or gallons is what we tend to use. Does anybody even know the units of that? Okay. Well, it's kilowatt hours. Okay. And kilowatt hour is a, a, a source of energy. It's a measure of the amount of energy that you consume, obviously per hour. So if you think of 10 100 watt light bulbs, okay, in your house, and hopefully you've switched them over to fluorescence so you don't have those anymore, but in California, by the way, is entertaining the idea of banning the incandescent light bulb. Interesting concept. Uh, on a kilowatt hour basis then, 10 100 watt, light, what, ugh, 10 100 watt light bulbs okay, equals one kilowatt. And if you run those for an hour, that's the kilowatt hour. And right now in Florida, that's about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. And our electricity out of the wall is relatively cheap, which is part of the reason why we deserve the degrade. Why fix it if it's cheap, okay? Now that's changing. Because the price of electricity out of the wall was $0.08 cents in 2000. Okay, and the price is going up. Okay. In Florida, we got all these people moving to the state, 1000 a day. All right. This is the business as usual plan. In 2014, the plan is to add more natural gas plants and more coal plants because we keep consuming energy. Now, we're concerned about this, not only because of climate change, but the fact that coal and natural gas don't come from Florida, the fact that we ship $20 billion a year outside of the state, okay, associated with this. Um, but also the fact that natural gas has gone up by a factor of four to six since 1998. So the reason your electricity rates are relatively cheap now is that fortunately the utilities have long-term gas contracts. As I mentioned, 51% of the electricity in Florida is used by the residents. Um, I'm hoping that we decide instead to build more fuel-efficient homes Okay, and in this case, it's most electricity in Florida. Okay, and so through a model that we have done, we can actually cut back on 26%, all right, and actually that energy investment is cheaper than buying electricity out of the wall. In other words, the payback would be cheaper on a kilowatt hour than actually buying the energy. And furthermore, you keep the wealth in the state if you actually invest it in your capital, your home. Okay, efficiency first, all right. Here's some examples of some numbers that have been done by some studies showing that the state of Florida could really make a difference in energy efficiency and the actual levelized cost would be a nickel a kilowatt hour, cheaper than what you pay out of the wall. Now we've done this in Florida. We actually have zero energy homes in Florida. This is an example of zero energy home in Lakeland, Florida. Right? The builder built his standard home up here, black roof. Built the same home, same footprint with a white roof. We reflect that sun, 
save on the energy. Added overhangs, you can see the shading here on the windows between the two, and also then photovoltaics and solar thermal hot water. This is, oops, oh, I must have stuck or something. <laughs> can you go back? There, right there. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, you can see what the energy consumption for the home on the left is, all right? You can see the energy consumption on the home on the right. The 70% saving was without adding the photovoltaics, so that was just through efficiency, all right? The additional 18, or the additional 22% was using the photovoltaics. And then more importantly, let's look at the cash. Okay, at 12 cents a kilowatt hour, we saved $1,800 a year, okay, all right? And then if you go ahead and add the photovoltaics in there, we save $2,400 a year. And look what the electric bill is, a little blue down there at the bottom. The University of Central Florida doesn't have Gatorade. We have a ceiling fan, though. You can go to Home Depot, okay, and purchase this energy-efficient ceiling fan. We've actually sold a million of them. It's the number one patent maker at the University of Central Florida. Okay, we have an energy-efficient ceiling fan. You can go buy one at Home Depot. The million we've sold have, sold have saved $20 million worth of energy just because the fan's more efficient. Likewise, you can do the same thing with inefficient refrigerators, inefficient other appliances. Okay? That's the biggest way that you can make an impact. And you can do it today. You don't have to wait for the government. Okay? Now, we've talked about coal and natural gas. Now I'm going to tell you about the sunshine. We are the sunshine state here in Florida. Okay? And last time I checked, sunshine's free. Okay, and the price isn't going to go up. So then the question lies, the power plant that uses sunshine, once we get that power plant down cheap enough, I don't have to worry about the risk associated with the price of fuel going up. And when's that going to happen? Well, according to the President of the United States, all right, his hope is that we have this done in the year 2015. I actually think we're going to do faster than that. You know the reason why? He says, cost competitive with today's technologies. Now, in the past, today's technology has always been flat economically. Now I'm telling you they're exponentially going up. So I think it's going to actually happen faster than that. Okay? This is the president's curve. I'll show you mine instead. Okay? All right? Today, if we were to buy electricity out of the wall, it's 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Right? In 2000, it was 8 cents a kilowatt hour. Right? This is the cost of photovoltaics on your roof. 32 cents, you say. Oh my gosh, that's way too expensive. Okay? Now, in 20 states in the United States, and we talked about energy policy here, a lot of the states are ahead of the federal government. In 20 states, they actually have buy-downs associated with renewable energy technologies. Okay? In those 20 states, they roughly buy down half the cost. So that 32 cents turns into 16 states. Okay? Now, in addition to tradable carbon credits and things like that, we have tradable renewable energy credits, and those exist today. We actually have those on the markets because those 20 states, in addition to providing a little bit of funds through their electric bills back to the consumers to install renewable energy technologies, they also have these portfolio standards, a requirement that so much of the electricity be generated from renewables. And in a lot of cases, they trade tradable renewable energy credits. Well, today on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, a kilowatt hour of renewable energy trades for four cents a kilowatt hour. So if I lived in New Jersey right now, my 32 cents turns into 16 cents, then it turns into 12 cents. So if I live in New Jersey, the cost of solar energy on my roof is the same as I pay out of the wall. Now, unfortunately, we're not there yet in Florida, but we're going to be, okay? Because there's a lot of smart people out there. They're just as smart as you, and they're going to figure out that, hey, this works out pretty well. Thank you. Okay. And uh, now let's look at the next comment. All right. Oops, I lost my laser beam. 32 cents. In 2011, it's 15 cents. In 2020, it's 9 cents. This is without government subsidies. This is what effectively Japan and Germany have done. They've added government support rebates, if you will, to the installation of photovoltaics on people's homes, but they've cut back the rebates, so they provide less of a rebate every year, 
as the industry actually cuts the overall price even lower. So as time goes on, we should be in a point where we don't need these rebates. I'll skip this. All right, uh, this is this comment about renewable energy uh, standards. Um, uh, Florida down here is not green. Um, Massachusetts is at 4%. We're working with the legislation in the state of Florida to get us to the point where we have a portfolio standard of about 5%. And I'm upbeat that that may actually pass this year. Okay. These are the uh, public benefit funds. That metering, I'll skip this. Um, this is a good one. The first oil embargo occurred. The state of California, in its energy per capita, energy per person, went flat. Okay. In other words, they designed their homes to be more energy efficient. Okay, they went flat. The energy level went fat. This was a similar plot we saw earlier with CO2. Europe, as you were shown earlier today, CO2 emissions actually started flattening out in Europe. Well, electricity use in California flattened out up the Arab oil embargo. Florida and the rest of the nation kept going up. And let's go look at today. That 5,000 kilowatt hours at 12 cents a kilowatt hour is $600 a person. There are 17 million of us in Florida. Because our homes aren't energy efficient, we throw away 10 billion bucks. Pretty scary. Of course, we can fix it. Buy energy efficient homes. Put energy efficient appliances in your house. Okay. Now, let me show you this plot. This plot here is the business as usual plot. In 2007, we're adding this much new capacity for natural gas. Now, I told you the price of natural gas keeps going up. Okay? Here's natural gas being added on with time. This is the first new coal plant that hits in Florida in 2011. There's a few that are already on the books, but, but the plan now is, is that we would add some new coal plants here. Okay? And we consume more coal. So this is this additional 75 megawatts that if we follow on the business as usual plan, that out in 2015, will have added this new power. This is the price of photovoltaics on your roof. Here's the cost, PV cost per kilowatt hour as a function of time. As I told you in, in, in earlier uh, today, it's up at 32 cents. As we move down here in 2011, when I first turn on that coal plant, first turn it on, the price of PV on your roof is 15 cents. And as you heard, the price of coal is actually going up, folks. So do we build that coal plant in the first place? and then have to deal with a stranded asset that you pay for later? Or do we find a way to put PV on your roof tonight? And by the way, it doesn't work tonight. That's the advantage of still keeping the grid, not trying to take anything away. Right? Something to think about. Right? I will also mention to you that if you decided to put a nuclear power plant in your backyard, which I know none of you would do, but if you did, it turns on in 15 years. The price of electricity for PV off your roof will be nine cents. Why bother? It's cheaper. It's a nice thing about sunshine. We have plenty of it. Okay, I've been told to sort of wind up here. So I'll hit with the... Uh, no. Okay, the Florida Solar Energy Center was actually created by the Florida legislature. We are part of the University of Central Florida. We're the largest state-supported energy institution in the United States. Have 150 people working at the Florida Solar Energy Center. I have 90 professionals. I have about 10 in solar thermal, and a solar hot water heater on your roof is a no-brainer. That's $0.08 cents a kilowatt hour right now if you buy it today. There's an upfront cost issue, but it's something you should do along with those fluorescent light bulbs. Right? We also then have about 10 people in the photovoltaic area. I have 40 people working in building energy efficiency. It's something we can do today. We don't have to wait for the government. You can do it today. All right? Thank you very much. Is the future in uh, biodiesel or um, hydrogen fuel cell? And if it is hydrogen, uh, there's a big difference between a million dollars and, and 15,000. Uh, is there a timetable set for that technology to become more affordable? I guess it depends on the meaning of the word future. I think uh, when the president said a child born today will you know, drive a hydrogen fuel vehicle, um, I think if the kid lives in New York City and doesn't learn to drive till he's 35 or 40, he's probably on target. I am not um, particularly optimistic about hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in the next couple of decades, um, not only because of the technology cost, but just the, the infrastructure issue. Um, so I think hydrogen has tremendous potential. One important thing to remember, though, is hydrogen is like electricity. It's, it's an energy carrier. You have to make it from something. And so 
If we have tremendous ability to produce renewable electricity, um, we can then use that renewable electricity to make clean hydrogen. If we find a way to make nuclear power clean and safe and not have proliferation risks, we can use that to make hydrogen without carbon emissions. Um, but my sense is there's actually been, um, well, it's not that there's been too much emphasis on hydrogen, but there's been too little emphasis on everything else. So I would be thinking that in the next 20 years, we're going to do probably more on the biofuel side of the equation. Um, not that you know, hydrogen is not going to have to come there eventually. We have a. I, I'm just going okay. to echo uh, some of those comments as well. I, I remind everybody that you're used to electricity out of the wall. That's electrons, okay? And from transportation, you're used to a liquid, okay? You're used to a liquid fuel, uh, gasoline or diesel. Um, and so infrastructures clearly play a big role with that. I would also like to remind everybody it's efficiency, it's efficiency, efficiency. And sometimes we get caught up in the silver bullet. You know, one problem solves them all. And I agree, we did feel that way about hydrogen. I'm concerned we feel that same way about ethanol, okay? Um, clearly, biomass is a very good source of possible fuels. It doesn't necessarily have to be ethanol. It could be something else you could get from it. It could be a gas. It could be anything else, okay? So uh, I, I, I agree with those same kind of comments. We've got to look at all the options, okay? Clearly, being more efficient is the first thing that we need to do. We have a question from one of our watchers, uh, viewers on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And we have about a minute left, so I'm going to ask the question and ask each of our speakers to respond to it quickly. The question is about shale oil reserves in the western United States. Could these reserves energize America for centuries? Wow, it's like a podcast. It's pretty cool. Um, they're not likely to uh, because the extraction of the oil shale is in and of itself such an energy intensive exercise that you could use it to displace oil, but it would come in absolute conflict with your carbon uh, challenge. I don't think it's a long-term answer.